So you, you have a unique perspective because you've excelled at both indoor and beach as a player, but more importantly, as a strength and conditioning coach, and I've worked with the top indoor and beach players. So what is the difference for you, I guess the similarities and the differences between training indoor and outdoor um, athletes for strength and conditioning? Yeah, um, man, there, there's so many different, uh, there's so, just so many different physical demands for each sport. Um, there's a lot of considerations that you have to count into. So, you know, for any strength coaches or even young athletes out there who are trying to figure out how to write their own workout um, or even how to put something together they can just do on their own. If they, let's say, can't afford a personal trainer, you got to think about one, what's kind of like that work to rest ratio of actual rally time, typically in an indoor game and in a beach game, what's the rest time? Um, let's say, for example, like beach. So you're looking at about seven seconds of actual play, typically, you know, of all the film we've watched are about 20 seconds of rest in between points. So refs kind of wiping out on the ball, tossing it over, getting ready. Of course, it changes a little bit. Um, the FIVB is, I mean, they're fast. Like these, these refs don't care. It's like, here, boom, serve, quick. Mm. And then AVP, I mean, you know, a lot of people just play to the crowd. A lot of people kind of hang out with them, on, you know, on the back line and talk a little bit before they serve. So um, it, it, there's, there, there's a difference there, but it's a typical seven seconds to 20 seconds there. Mm. Um, now, in terms of the training differences, because I know for beach, obviously we have sand that affects the ground contact time. Um, I know there's more, from my experience working with beach athletes, which is limit, much more limited um, than you, so you can definitely provide greater insight. Uh, the approach is more of a gallop because you want to go into the sand and compress it, create a hard surface so you can jump straight up, a little less broad jumping. Um, also, the co-contraction time is longer for beach because you're just having one your surfaces are constantly uneven so it's not everything contracting all at once right it's almost like a delayed shift mm -hmm. so i'm kind of curious how do you tr adapt to those differences based on the, the the surfaces like that yeah definitely that's that's definitely a huge aspect too i mean the ground contact is very different um and I guess, interestingly enough, there's a lot more ground contact and touches uh, and jumping, if per se, with the indoor game compared to the beach game. So that's another consideration you have to think about, too, uh, making sure these athletes, their workload capacity is, is matching the demands of the game, right? So if it's not and you're not managing the recovery, they're more than likely going to run into some issues um, physically, right? So different injuries. Um, and with the beach game, I think, yeah, the huge thing with um, with those athletes is, yeah, it's very hard and the co-contraction is a little bit longer for sure. And so in the weight room, a lot of times you're looking at exercises that um, that forces you to work on, let's say, explosive strength, right? So explosive or reactive strength, two different things. So a really easy way instead of explaining it to just have you picture is, um, let's say you have like a hex bar, hex bar uh, squat or barbell back squat, right? So explosive strength is if I tell you, all right, well, you're going to go down, you're going to get into a squat position, whatever position you like to jump out of or as low as you get on defense. Let's say you hold it for a tempo, it's hold, hold it for three to five counts, right? After the three or five counts, you jump up, land, reset, all right? Next one, go down, hold for three counts, jump, land, reset. And a reactive is a lot more, all right, start tall, drop and jump right away as fast as you possibly can. So those are to make it easy for you to understand that those are the two different components there. Um, and a lot of times there, there's a lot of uh, isometric, you know, um, explosive exercises like that in the weight room because it takes into account when you're trying to jump out of these uh, isometric positions, you've taken away the elasticity of these muscles, right? It's going to be uh, um, release as heat at this point. So just like a fun fact for people, when your muscles stretch and contract, the faster you can get in and out of that and go through that cycle, uh, the better. If you take too long at the bottom, then it gets released as heat and your potential to uh, get out of that quickly um, pretty much diminishes. So we, we put those athletes in those positions, right? Whether uh, unilaterally or bilaterally, <clears throat> then force them to get out of it, whether it's up and down, uh, whether it's uh, side to side, um, or whatever is pertaining to different uh, scenarios in their sport. 
And uh, we think, you know, we think that that's going to help them uh, prepare for those kind of demands, you know, what's going to happen in sand, right? I don't, I don't think mm, a lot of things in the weight room can mimic the sand, obviously, but those are just some of the things, how we can, how we can manipulate how the fibers work, right? How the muscles work um, and what, what the sand takes away, which is the, a lot of that reactive or elastic component. So we try to do that in the weight room as well. Mm. That's cool. I, I, um, I, I, I learned something there in terms of having greater emphasis of the explosive strength. So uh, pausing at the bottom. Um, yeah, I do, I do see a difference in, because what's visually confusing sometimes is that some beach athletes, and, and what I see just through the eye test, they look leaner. So when mm -hmm. I think of leaner, I think of more elastic, more dependent on elastic energy, but then the sand takes away all that. So there is a greater emphasis on explosive strength. So being able to generate greater force from a standstill position uh, because all the elastic energy is going to be taken away. Whereas if you're on hardwood or sport court, you're just bouncing off the floor using your tendons. Uh, so that's, that's cool. So if, I guess if you're trained for beach, make sure you focus on a lot of a seated box jumps, one of my favorite um, explosive strength exercises to take away elastic and eccentric. Um, so, yeah, same I, here. I, Love the exercise. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. guess another thing I would bring up too is um, looking at the different things that are going on in beach, right? So, let's say you take a blocker. Um, there are scenarios where they're delay blocking, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they're diving or leveraging, whatever they're doing, um, the, sometimes they're waiting down there at that bottom position and then having to get out instead of, you know, indoor, you just a big open step, follow up, big swing block. So it, it, the speed of it is, is very, so varied within beach with how each task is carried out. Uh, that's why we got to make sure that these athletes aren't just one dimensional or two dimensional. They're, they're multidimensional. Yeah. And, um, and then for defenders, I mean, defenders more than those blockers are, are going to be placed in the weight room in those isometric positions and trying to get out of that low position because they're playing deep. They're sitting there. They're not moving. They're just sitting and having to sprint for everything. Right. So it's a lot different indoor where you, you're, you're designated this spot on the court. You are um, asked to dig these certain balls and there's a driving force of this is your task. This is your role and that's it. Right. And so, you know, if you're a defender on the beach, the court, the court's all yours, right? If the, especially if the blocker doesn't do their job, you're having to, um, you're you're asked to do a lot um, out of a standstill position. So if you, a lot of people start watching film, and they start watching these defenders and how they move, a lot of times you'll notice they're um, they're kind of sitting there, mm -hmm. and they either hop in place or they uh, side shuffle right or they fake whatever they're doing. There's different movements, yeah. and you have to understand too that like. Sometimes they do it to their advantage because it helps them get in and out. They can use a little bit of elasticity yeah. to get out of that. And so just standing still. So that's just a fun fact for people. Obviously, it's game strategy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that the – for I don't know some beach, there's a lot of blockers that <laughs> just wait at the bottom. And I'm assuming they're trying to get out of the visual box of the hitter to be more mm -hmm. deceptive. Or maybe yep. they don't know what tempo they're going to be setting at, so they have to be loaded. But a completely mm -hmm. different blocking technique for for indoor i can't imagine how much more glycogen that burns just i mean first of all you're blocking so much more in beach if i'm a single blocking position right oh yeah so how do you handle that i mean just contracting for that long in that bottom position and these guys are like just above parallel it's, it's not like a quarter squat right it's it's pure muscle recruitment so how do you adapt to those, I don't know what to put it. I mean, those glycogen demands. Glycogen demands. You're just holding, flexing for so long. Yeah. So that that goes back to how we prepare for it in the weight room too. Um, <clears throat> so we we got to take into account that we got to put them in these deep positions. So that's why the the off season is so important because we really focus on their ability to hold these positions for a period of time um, and to be able to get out of it effectively. Um, some athletes also can't do that as well. So like, if you look at some of our blockers, um, there's a few guys who only get into a half squat and that's all they can go. Some can only get into a quarter squat and instead they start hinging over and they like touch the ground mm. because they don't have that mobility. 
Yeah. And very, very few, I would say, can get all the way down, right? Out there, you know, what people would say, ask the grass mm-hmm. and be able to get out of it. So, um, so I guess not everybody is able to get there. And so they don't have that demand on them. Mm-hmm. And some people just, they just naturally, they have it. They play like that their whole life. So it's not very hard. Um, and I guess not every single block is like that. You could say as well. So sometimes it could be a quick block and quick go. Sometimes you really load up. Um, it really depends on how that game's going and the tempo of it. I mean, if, if that team's on the opposing end is in system a lot, then you can have more time to set up and do your thing and gather and play with your strategy. Uh, if that team's a little bit more more crafty, maybe not passing so well and the ball's just moved around a lot, you as a blocker are just doing a lot of chasing. Mm-hmm. And with that chasing, you can't you can't get there quick, load all the way down and get out. So it really depends on the game. So I guess it's safe to say, too, um, I guess they're lucky that they don't have to get into that position get every single time. Um, but I hope that answers it. Yeah, no, that does. And one another difference I noticed too is um, for hitting wise, I noticed for beach pretty much the usual straight up and down, but very often being able to land almost two feet at the same time, very consistently, just because the set's going to be more up and down. Whereas the indoor demands, there's a lot more shearing forces on your knee because the tempo and you're, you're trying to time your broad jumping approach at an angle going toward the set while it's going across you. So if you don't get it in time, you're going to have to lean and then your right leg is going to counterbalance. You're going to land and partially rotate just to hit away from your body, just to keep it in a lot more of that going on. So how do you adapt your training to, I guess those, those type of demands for indoor athletes who have to get into these really awkward positions, hitting wise, landing and jumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, the biggest thing with indoor athletes for sure land one, one leg. I mean, it's going to happen, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's inevitable. It's, I haven't been able to, you know, tell athletes every time, Hey, you're going to land on two feet every single time you hit and you're going to be pitch perfect. I mean, you're going to be perfect. Yeah. And Chris, it just doesn't happen. So and now a lot of strength coaches have veered away from that and, you know, have really adapted the idea of, all right, well, they're, they're always going to land one leg, right? So we can't just tell them to not do that. Now we have to train for that. Yeah. So a lot of the, there's a lot of different exercises. Um, maybe starting out, you're doing a lot of different skaters, let's say, different holes, landing on that one leg, sticking it, then progressing it from a height, right? And then height and distance. And that could be, modified progress regress in so many different ways whether with med balls or different weights um, with cables bands so and um you know there's even exercises where uh let's say i have an athlete right we're standing you're standing right next to me and you're jumping up whatever angle or even straight up straight down keeping it basic and i have whether it's just my hands or i take like a yoga ball physio ball and i give you a hard shove mid-air and then you're forced to land with both feet reset same thing maybe later maybe less of a shove as we progress you land on one feet so uh, it it just kind of varies and then sometimes you can have athletes um standing on a box right you know drop off landing drop off landing one leg doing it laterally Mm -hmm. and i just interestingly i've been doing a little more of um having them on the box jumping off turning 90 degrees landing turning 90 degrees landing or turning 180 degrees um and eventually progressing that where they would hold a med ball or something heavy that's a lot more forces pulling down and it forces them to hit the brakes harder right and being more rigid so putting them in a lot of different positions and forcing them to land in those positions whether bilaterally unilaterally and just um giving them a lot more stress on that end so that they're used to those components when it when it comes game time because before it was just lift, lift, jump, lift, maybe some single leg stuff, single arm stuff, lift, more jumping, maybe some landing, but then it never was really geared toward, all right, now there's this whole other realm of, all right, game-like scenario. How are we going to make sure that when it comes time that we're ready for these very specific things? So yeah. that's kind of how, how we go about it in our thought process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do a lot of that with my clients too, uh, depending on their stage of development and their position. You know, middles are going to be rarely contorted in their hitting. It's it's a fixed moment. It's a lot of more drifting. Can they handle the push one and the back one from, but luckily for them, it's it's very predictable. Um, outsides, opposites, um, you know, a lot of 
just weird positions. Yeah.